Well, hello there, everyone. Uh, I don't see a yellow thing around my... I'm, I'm good? Okay, good. Great. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the choir. I love that uh, the music. My wife has performed it as a soloist. Now I see she's doing it as a choir. Beautiful piece with a tremendous message. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It's, it's marvelous. I would like to address... Uh, Live church services, San Jose and Eureka will have just a little easier time uh, since we our halls are private. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the problem with San Jose is they have a, a daily nursery and we have to deal with uh, young people coming in and out and parents and, and we are managing with a lot of protocols to let make sure that everyone is safe and to feel safe as, as well. Eureka is gonna be a little easier, though I have to deal with the Humboldt County Emergency Operations Center. Uh, they would like a, a plan on how we're going to conduct services uh, for their review and approval, though that's, it's not a requirement, it's certainly something to, for us to consider. It looks like we might be able to start San Jose and Eureka, at least I hope to first week in July, that, that's our hope. So much going on, so much going on. One of the, one of our favorite, one of my favorite apostles or disciples uh, is uh, a brother in Christ is uh, Peter. Peter is a, a man filled with enthusiasm and filled with energy, sometimes filled with a, a little bit of uh, presumption. We know a bit about Peter. We know uh, his actions and his attitudes. And they provide constant opportunity for us to understand the depth and the breadth of the gospel of the kingdom of God. To better understand our relationship with God and Jesus Christ. To more completely understand how we continue, may continue to grow in grace and knowledge. The example of Peter is just a delight. Um, I think hopefully we all have a Peter in our, in our lives who has that uh, wonderful example. Again, we know a little bit about Peter. Uh, we know some of his background from anecdotes and from factual history. For example, Peter was also known as Simeon, which would, had been shortened to, to Simon. We, he was also called Simon Barjona, Barjona meaning Simon, son of Jonah. Peter, Peter lived in the Galilean city of Capernaum and had been married. Uh, remember back in, in uh, Matthew, I think, Matthew 8. Uh, Jesus went to Peter's house and saw his mother-in-law, who was sick, and she, he healed her, and then she got up and, and uh, was working around, work, helping everyone around. In Capernaum, he and Andrew partnered with James and John, the sons of Zebedee, as fishermen. They, they had a business together. And when Andrew brought Simon Barjona to meet Jesus Christ, Andrew was a follower of John the Baptizer. And he informed Peter that he had found the Messiah. Think of this. this. This has been prophesied over and over and over. And then came to you and said, we found the Messiah. He's here right now. He met Jesus Christ. And Christ, knowing Peter's strength, knowing Peter's passion, knowing his energy, changed Simon Peter's name to Kephas, Kephas, C-E-P-H-A-S, which is Aramaic for stone or pebble. In Greek, it's Petras, Petros, sorry, Petros, which means stone. And his name, he said, not to be confused with Jesus Christ, upon this rock, this rock, Matthew 16, I will build my church, meaning himself. Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation. The word rock here is Petra, meaning large rock or crag. There's a distinction between Peter, who was going to serve Christ, and Christ, who is the rock of our salvation. So they started having a relationship. Jesus was teaching the people by the Sea of Galilee. Let's turn over to Luke 5. Great place to start. Wonderful story here that is going to help us with what, where we are today. Luke 5. Please. Luke 5, verse 4. Luke 5, verse 4. 
So here, here's an example of, of Peter, an interaction between Peter and Christ, actually the disciples in Christ. Jesus Christ had just given a discussion, and he said, when he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your net, nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Now, they're out in the Sea of Galilee. The depth of the Sea of Galilee is about 150. 41, 150 feet deep. It's not terribly deep. And I've got more to say about the Sea of Galilee. During the day, the fish go deep to stay cool. During the evening, they come up and they, they feed. So here it is daytime. They caught nothing all night. And Christ said, put your nuts down. Peter finally says, Master, we have to toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. He had a relationship with Christ and trusted him. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners. They signaled to, to the other guys, bring your boat over. So they signaled the, their partners in the other boat to come over and help them. And when they when they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. So great was the blessing of God during a time when there should be no fish that the, the boat was sinking. The boat was singing. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. You will be a fish, fisher of men. I'm going to change your job. I changed your name. Now I'm going to change your job. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. It was, it was a change of, of lifestyle. It was a change of everything. But what was fascinating here is, at your word, I will let down my net. And it was a good thing he did. It was a good thing he did. We, he would learn to trust Christ. He learned to trust Christ. In Mark, it says, when they picked up all the, all the fish, he said, depart from me. I am a sinful man. Go away from me. I don't deserve to be in your presence. He says, don't be afraid. Now you will be a, a catcher of men. From that point on, Peter became the Peter the fisherman Peter became the fisher of men, and he changed his job. So he had been on the Sea of Galilee. He knows what it is to fish. He's been a fisherman all his life. Now I want to take you to another story. This one really approaches where we are today. This one approaches where we are today. This one is also associated with our, our friend Peter, and it's also associated with the Sea of Galilee or Lake Knesset or Lake Tiberias. It depends on, on uh, your reference point in history. It's interesting that the Sea of Galilee is the largest body of water in Israel, largest fresh body of water in Israel. But it's not as large as you think. I was in Israel in, in 2009, and we were coming up over a rise, and we're getting close to the Sea of Galilee, and I'm excited because I love water. And as we come over the hill, I'm thinking I'm going to see this large sea. I'm going to see waves crashing. My mind really didn't think it through. I'm in the middle of the desert. It's not going to happen that way. And as we come over the rise, I start looking at one end of, of the Gal of Sea of Galilee to the other end of the Sea of Galilee. And my mind goes, I can swim that. It's not terribly big. It's roughly 13 miles by 8 miles. And you know, put me in the center of it. I can swim four miles. That's not a problem for me. It's half the size of Lake Tahoe, for a reference, as far as dimension. It's about half the size of Lake Tahoe. What's interesting, too, is you read the stories of the storms on, on the Sea of Galilee, and I began to, to doubt myself. Well, wait a minute. This is a small lake. Well, in 1992, there was a storm that caused six-foot waves to crash into the city of Tiberias, damaging buildings, closing a restaurant, cafes, and covering the road. 
what, what takes place is because it, it is shallow and it's in a valley when the, the, uh, um, the weather, I, forgive me, my whatever, comes down and presses down, the pressure pressures down on the ocean. It doesn't go deep, it goes out, causing big waves. People get stuck in the center of, of Galilee. So my perspective was put back in place when the Bible says these seasoned uh, fishermen were afraid when they were in the middle of, of the Sea of Galilee. Anyway, let's go, let's go to Matthew 14. Matthew 14. Because there's, there's another story I want to, want to touch on, which adds so dramatically to where we are today in a very dramatic world. Matthew 14. Jesus Christ had just fed 5,000 people. He had talked to them. They were hungry. Disciples wanted to send them away. And he said, no, let's feed them. What do we have to feed them with? Well, we got five loaves of bread and two fish. And Christ thought, that's enough. And he blessed it, broke it up, fed 5,000 people. It's important to understand this miracle right at this point. Fed 5,000 people and then have 12 baskets full left over with everyone full. I mean, an extraordinary mess, uh, miracle took place. So right after that, verse, let's go to, to verse... Uh, 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples go into the boat and before him to the other side. While he went up, he went, uh, he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth hour, watch, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. Now, the fourth watch is 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So you got guys sleeping on deck. You got the, the, the night watch watching. You got a storm raging. And there's a shadow coming right toward the boat. Now, if you're a fisherman, you may see fins on the surface. And you know what those are. You got a body, you got a humanoid, you got a, someone standing there coming right at you. And you go, what is that? What is that? And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a spirit. The word here in, in the King, New King James, it says ghost, but it just means an apparition. It means uh, a vision. It's, it's something that we're not expecting. And it, and what could it possibly be? And they were afraid. And be, let's see, no, I'm sorry. It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. It's interesting when you read the story in Mark, Jesus Christ, it said that he was going to walk past them. And they caught sight of him. It's an interesting thing. He's just sauntering out there in the middle of a storm, meandering. But we get back now to our favorite disciple, Peter. Christ said, don't be afraid. It is I. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Sort of like a, I think it's you. I want to trust in you. I hope it's you. But if is you, command me, and when you command me, I will do as you say. And Jesus said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Christ. He stepped over the gunnels, put his feet on the water, and I don't know how that might have worked, because the boat was going up and down. Did he go up and down with it? I don't know. But he stepped on solid. And he walked on water. Did he take one step, two step, three steps? If you take one step, that's not really walking, is it? If, you're, if your hand's still holding onto the railing of the boat, that's not really walking. He walked away from the boat. He walked on water. And when, he, and when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. 
It didn't say he went blue. It didn't say he went underwater. He went to sink. How far down? I don't know. Knees, ankles, the calves, to his waist? I don't know. But he started to sink. And he looked at Christ and he said, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. The storm stopped. Everything went calm. And those who were and those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. What an extraordinary experience that he had. If you are the if you are the Lord command me and I'll come out there. Peter showed a willingness to try the humanly impossible action of walking on water. And hearing Jesus Christ giving him approval, he stepped out from the boat, climbed over the rail. He began to walk on water. He, 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 uh, his body disavowed physical, uh, uh, well, I was trying to be clever there. <laughs> physical laws, yeah. He was trying to disavow physical laws and he began walking toward his master, seemingly to do so, doing the impossible. But then he looked around, and the howling wind and the crashing waves soon diverted his attention. He began to sink into the raging sea. Panic set in, and with fright in his eyes, he looked to Christ, which we all should do. He said, Lord, save me. Christ stretched out his hand, caught him with a firm grip, reassuringly lifted him up, and took him to the boat. And then he just said, chided him a little bit, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? This drama, and there's, there's so many uh, stories like this throughout the, the, the Bible, provides us a powerful lesson of faith and focus for us today. This was just one event. The fishing partnership told, uh, they were told to go to sea by Christ. It was a dark and stormy night. Christ strolled toward the the, the boat unbothered and unaffected by the tossing waves. Peter in zealous and zeal filled with verve and passion, seeing his master defying the laws of nature, walking on water, believed that he could as well, that he would be able to, to defy physics and join him. Stepped out of the boat in faith. It had to be in faith or he would not have been able to walk on water. Again, I don't know how many steps he took. It had to be more than one, likely two or three, unknown. But he had to be away from the boat. So it's just him and Christ and the, and the water. And he did walk on water, believing in Christ, until his focus shifted. As long as he believed in Jesus Christ's command to, for him to come, and as long as he looked at Christ, he could deal with something that was unnatural. Walking on water is just unnatural. He then looked at the crashing of waves on the boat. He looked at the howling wind and he became distracted from the miracle that was taking place right then. And he said to himself, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. This isn't right. I can't be doing this. And when he said that, he started to sink. He started to lose sight. And looking at Christ, he said, help me. And Jesus Christ did. The problem? Peter had become distracted by the elements and the environment around him. He forgot the miracles that took place that, that morning, that day, when they fed 5,000 people with a handful of food. He had just forgotten that he was on water, walking toward Christ. Christ his master was walking on water. But the elements and the, the environment distracted him. We have a lesson to learn here. We have a lesson to learn here. We all are surrounded right now by tremendous trials and difficulties. And sometimes we can get so wrapped up, we can lose focus of where we're going, why we're going, and what we're doing, and get wrapped up in things that will not help us to grow. 
When we experience trials and difficulties, and we will, we will, we need, we, when we spend time focusing on the problems and, and the surroundings and the elements and not the solutions to those problems, when we dwell on the pain, the unfairness, the difficulties to fix and or overcome, the drama, the impact on us, we run the risk of losing focus on what really is important, what really is foundational, what really is grounding, what really is the guiding principles by which we should live our lives. Peter's example is a wonderful example of faith and action, of, of faith and loss of, of, of direction. What do we see in our lives? Where are we? Do we allow the environment and the elements around us to distract us from our calling? From our calling. Distractions really caused a lot of problems. I don't know about you, but I do a lot of driving. Well, I did until March. And accidents take place. And there was a, there was, um, I'm trying to think of the number of accidents are due to, 65% of accidents are from distractions within a car. Meaning conversations, drop something, something took place within the vehicle and 35% distractions from outside. Uh, I was almost rear-ended. There was an accident, and the car coming behind me was so in, enthralled with what was be to the side, almost hit me. It happens. It happens. I'm surprised by drivers who are in the fast lane and four lanes over, that was their exit. They forgot. They were distracted. They were listening to music, or they were having a good conversation, and all of a sudden, there's their exit. Let's go. And sometimes with, with looking and sometimes without looking, they just head for their exit. And we have accidents. Distractions are anything that takes our vision, our mind, and our focus off of where we are and puts it on to the problem and the solution only. We grow. We overcome when we focus on the solution. We, fo we grow when we look at the answers that the Bible gives to us. For all the things in our lives, you know, we start, we clearly identify the problems. We do this every year around the Passover time. We, we evaluate ourselves, we examine ourselves to see where we are in the faith. Usually it's around Passover time, but I'd like to think we do it all the time. Where are we on a daily basis? And we clearly identify and determine the depth and the breadth and complexity of the problems in our lives and look at God's word for the solution. For some, it's the idea is to write out what is troubling us. This is kind of a form of engaged meditation. Un unlike what society says, meditation is never used to empty your mind, but is used to, to provide focused attention on a given issue and how to overcome that issue. We could ask the questions, what happened? Why did it happen? Where is my attitude? What am I thinking? What did I say? How did I react? How do I treat others? How do, how do they react to me? What is the Christian approach that I should have taken? Especially in the future. We, sh we should then take such med meditation to God, who is the true arbiter of our problems and solutions, asking for help to identify the root cause of our problems and, and help us see our solutions. Jesus Christ was right there in front of, of Peter. He was the answer. Christ was the answer to Peter's starting to sink into the, into the water. And then we remain on, on the solution. I, I'll, I'll give you an admission for years growing up. Uh, I was pretty good at identifying my problems and my issues. I was excellent at that. But I stayed on the problem. I wrapped my arms around it. I looked at every nuance of it. I cared for it. I treasured the problem. I didn't start growing until I said, well, that's the problem. Now let's, let's grow. Let's change. I was very good at, at identifying the problem. And I kept it. I cared for it, which is not what we want to do, which is not what we don't want to do. How often we, we remain at the same level of thinking that got us into trouble 
and difficulties. And now we're surprised that we haven't gone forward, haven't grown. In Isaiah, <coughs> excuse me, Isaiah 55, this should be a foundational thought in our heads as we look for answers around us. He gives us a reminder that we don't often think on the appropriate level. We don't often think of the appropriate level. This is a very easy scripture. I think it's easy scripture. But in Isaiah 55, this is God talking to us. His inspired word. Sometimes we think we have the answer. Sometimes we really got the answer and we're going to hang on to it. 55 verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For, our, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I'll just stop right there. Sometimes I think I have the answer to my troubles and my problems, and I don't. Sometimes I, I can think through my trials. No. And sometimes I'm stuck in the middle of my trials because I don't think, as God said, I don't see his perspective. I could be overwhelmed. I could be, un, I could be feeling helpless. I could feel broken. I think of revenge. I want to take sides. I want to fix things in this world today. But I forget that I need to see from God's perspective. I would need to see the world from God's viewpoint. How does God see our trials? How does he see uh, the solutions around us? Jesus Christ, there standing in front of Peter, was his answer. Jesus Christ is still the answer to all our ills. Everything that's outside today is our answer. And what did he teach? He taught the gospel of the kingdom of God. That was going to be my message today. I was going to, I was going to preach today. I had it all done. I had thousands of scriptures. Well, give or take. On, okay, now the answer is Jesus Christ, the coming of Jesus Christ. The solution is Jesus Christ. But we had this wonderful message from, from Vic Kubik in his note on Thursday. And I go, okay, something else. Something else. But the solution is the kingdom of God. We're not going to solve the problem today. We're not going to solve racism today. We're not going to solve inequity today. We're not going to solve uh, COVID-19 today. We're not going to solve all these things. But God is allowing us to go through them so that we represent him on earth today, so that we live a Christian life. Others can see what Christian life is like. And we can set the standard for what is coming. When we open our Bibles, when we ask God to show us how he sees the solution in our lives, how things should look through his eyes, we shouldn't care how Oprah handles a given situation. We shouldn't be influenced by Dr. Phil's take on character and personal control. Pop culture and psychology should not be our driver. As I've often said, it's not what did Jesus do? I mean, it's not what, what would Jesus do? I'm sorry. It's what did he do? We don't arbitrate. We don't consume. We don't think about what Jesus Christ did. I mean, would say. We don't assume what he would say. But what did he do? And then we use that as the foundation. We use that as a foundation. It's hard for us sometimes to view what God says and what God expects and, and say, well, I've got to change because that can be very hard. But we focus on the end result. We focus on what is coming. The kingdom of God is for eternity. This world around us is not for eternity. When Jesus and Peter returned to the boat where the, where the other disciples had been watching the, the miracle and the incredible series of events unfold, they said, truly, you are the Son of God. They recognized that Jesus, the Son of God, the rock upon whom we place our faith, was the so solution to Peter's problem. Jesus Christ is the solution to our problem. The problem that Peter experienced was distractions was distractions i'm going to jump ahead here because i realize i've been enjoying myself a little too much by definition webster's revised unabridged defines distraction as the act of distracting a drawing apart or separation 
that which separates you from your direction, that which diverts attention, a diversion, or it's a diversity of direction. It's a detachment. What took place for Peter was he was, became detached Detached from Christ, separated from Christ, just saw his environment and said, I can't do this. It is a state in which the attention is called in different ways. There's confusion in distraction. There's a perplexity in distraction. And all of us run the risk of being distracted spiritually, of being distracted spiritually. Peter lost focus by his by the elements and his environment jesus christ was right in front of him and as close as peter was he lost focus we too run the risk of losing focus there are a couple of distractions i want to talk about these are what i call the enemies of faith there's a handful actually there's more than i've got here of course these are four tendencies that undermine faith to the point where Jesus Christ chides the chides people with the phrase, O ye of little faith. The first is worry. Anxious thought or worry is one. Peter looked around at the ri ri uh, rising waves, the blowing wind, the white caps, the fear in the, in the face of his uh, friends on board the boat began to worry that his thinking was wrong, that his belief that if Jesus could walk on water, that he could as well. And worry gnaws at our thoughts and distracts us from the truth of the events. Jesus Christ gives us a wonderfully inspired instruction. Matthew 6, please. Matthew 6, verse 25. Matthew 6, verse 25. There's a passage about, really talks about worry. He said, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds in the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? I mean, he's putting a tremendous value on us. I love studying the creation. I, I love the, the brilliance and the beauty of God's creation and how everything works interdependent with each other, except for man. Man, man fouls up a lot, a lot of God's creation. Which of you worry by worrying can add one cubic to a stature? I'd like to be a little taller and hasn't happened yet. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field that they grow. They neither <clears throat> toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. I mean, God's creation is beautiful. Verse 33. To put things in perspective. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? Where am I going to get my job? Where is the food going to come from? What about the clothes on my back? What about my job? What about society all around me? Do not worry. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, but your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He already understands the human condition. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own problem. There's, there's enough coming yet. We don't need to worry about things yet to come. I lost, I lost my backup here, but uh, there were some studies that indicated that only about 8% of the things we worry about ever affect our lives. Only 8%. Meaning that 92% of our worries are a waste of time. 92% of, of the time, things that we worry about don't happen but they sap our energy and they take away from our faith. Jesus said that God would take care of our needs, cautioning us, don't worry. Look to him. Jesus Christ was right in front of Peter. He was standing on water. Peter, Peter himself was standing on water and he let worry cause him to start to sink. Now worry leads, leads another to another distraction, and that is fear. 
One of the enemies of, of faith is worried. The second that I'm, I'm using is fear. Peter stepped out in faith, but lost sight of the power and majesty and the promise of God, the creator of all things. When asked if he, Peter, could come out to meet him, Christ, and the Christ said, come. The creator of all things said, come join me. Come on in. The water's fine. That's a promise that Christ gave Peter. I give you permission to defy the laws of physics with me. This is not a joke. This is not a prank. Join me. And Peter started to. Peter should have remembered the example of the day before feeding 5,000. Peter should have remembered that early on that to pick up, uh, go fishing in the daytime and the nets almost broke from the fish that joined the net. There was a history of proof of God's power in Peter's life, but he forgot. Matthew, back, Matthew 8, verse 23. Matthew 8, verse 23. Just to recall a little bit, Matthew 8, verse 23. Yeah, now when he, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose so that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Christ was asleep. You know, I've been on... In the Channel Islands, uh, there's a Venturi effect where, where uh, you go between islands and it's not an easy trip. Let's just say the waters create some wonderful rides. And uh, yeah, enough said. And the disciples came to him and woke him saying, Lord, save us for we are perishing. Why are you so fearful? Oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea and there was great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the, the winds and the sea obey him? Well, he was creator. He was the creator God. He was the creator God. <laughs> Christ directly connected fear to losing faith. And something fell. I don't know what that was. So when the storm uh, struck the boat carrying the disciples, he chastised them for being overly concerned for their safety. They had the creator with them. Now, the apostle John, in 1 John 4, for time I won't go there, 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect, <clears throat> has not been made perfect in love. When we have perfect love in us, we won't have fear for whatever situation we're in because we will have learned to trust our Father, learn to trust God. Distractions for enemies of faith or distractions is worry, fear, and now I want to add doubt. Doubt. Doubt is another enemy of faith. Matthew 14. Back to Matthew 14. When, Jesus, when Peter was walking on water to meet Christ, and he began to sink, Christ pointed to the cause of the problem. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I, I won't read it again. Why did you doubt? Peter saw Jesus Christ walking on the water on the Sea of Galilee and asked if he could do so. Do the same. Jesus invited him to join him, promised him he would be successful. And in that, in that promising invitation, he could break the laws of nature. So Peter got out on the water. And when he saw everything, he became afraid, and he began to sink. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Doubt causes us a worry and fear, then causes us to doubt the power of God, to doubt God's ability to take care of us, to doubt the word of God, John 17, 17, his word is truth. So that, as in the Garden of Eden, when you had some one distract Adam and Eve, with a, with a slight idea, hey, you know, God's not telling you everything. They began to doubt God's ver veracity, his truth. They started to mistrust God. And that's what happened to Peter. He started with worry, fear, and doubt. I mean, it hit him all at once. Even though the Christ was walking on water in front of him, even though he stepped away from the boat, even though he took his hand off the boat, he was on water. The environment still overwhelmed him. One, one last 
distraction with the time I have is human reasoning. Human reasoning. Human reasoning is probably one of the biggest enemies of faith that we have. And James kind of maps out how the process works. James 1, please. James 1. James 1, just after Hebrews. James 1, verse 6. There are times when we go before our God, when we need his intervention, when we look to him for help, when we look to him for guidance, when we look to him for, for structure in our lives. James 1, verse 6. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let him, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. For he is a double-minded man, un unstable in all his ways. The reference here kind of goes back to Peter walking on water. He doubted. He let worry and fear overcome him to the point where he doubted the ability of God and Christ. And then he added human reasoning. Then he added human reasoning. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, no doubt. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. You can put it, uh, you can put it in your notes. I'll cite this, Proverbs 3, 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Lean not to your own understanding. Again, just to cite the reference, Matthew 16, 6. He said, warned the disciples, take heed and be, oh, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the, and the disciples wondered uh, what, what physical leavening of bread. And Christ chided them and said, oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves? Why do you use human reasoning? Because you, you have thought that we have not brought any bread. That's a big issue. And he then said they wouldn't have missed the point if they kept their mind on the miraculous uh, bread provided. And that he himself was the bread, bread of life. We all have proof of uh, our evidence and proof in our lives of God's miraculous interventions in our lives and how often we get distracted by the elements and the conditions around us. And when we worry, when we fear, when we begin to doubt, we doubt God's power Doubt, doubt his ability, doubt his plan, and then step away, and then we use human reasoning to try and put it all to, into place. And that's not what we should do. 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. Paul has one very simple statement. When we find ourselves in great difficulty, and we can and we, we will, we maybe even are, to put it badly, There's a simple statement for all of us. 1 Corinthians 2, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring uh, to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. When we look around us and we, we see the protests and, and the, 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 the inequity in this world, it's, it's horrible. When we look around the world and we see so many issues that cannot be solved today. You and I have the solution right here in this book. It is the kingdom of God. It's the return of Jesus Christ. It is the hope this world needs. And we live by that hope today. We live by that hope now. And we don't let ourselves get distracted by the elements and conditions around us. Unlike Peter at that time, when he allowed worry and fear and doubt to step in and then to be overwhelmed by human thought and reasoning, we see the end of the boat. We, I mean, the end, of, end the end of the book. We know Jesus Christ wins. We know that, I, I love the phrase, he says, there's not going to be any more tears. No more crying. And for what the world is going through today, there are a lot of tears, real hard felt tears. But what's coming is different. Some, some citing references, Psalm 86, 11 says, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your, your truth. 
unite my heart to fear your name. First Timothy 4.16, we are told to focus on your life and your teaching, talking about God. It is inevitable that we will run into distractions in our lives. And it's most important that we stay focused on God and his ways, not to allow worry, not to allow fear, not to allow doubt, and not to allow human reasoning to overwhelm us from the gospel of the kingdom of God, from the true conclusion to all man's problems, the true hope that mankind needs right now today. We do this by, of course, studying his word, by praying for his guidance and applying the lessons learned. So often we need the application to better understand the wisdom of God. We need to apply. Peter applied his trust in God and faith in Christ and got out of the, the boat. He focused on Jesus and he walked in faith until he allowed the tempest of the world around him to distract him and cause him to worry, to doubt, and to fear, and then reason himself so that he started to sink. Whenever we find ourselves under such distress, tossed about by problems and difficulties and conflicts, remember the lesson from Peter's aquatic stroll. Don't be anxious in thought. Don't fear what you see. Don't doubt your father's power and strength and intention for what he has in your life and have faith in God. Jeremiah 29, 11 says that I know Christ knows, God knows what my thoughts are for you to give you a hope and a future. It's not this world around us, but it's, it's a true hope and a future. And then to keep in mind Romans 8, 28, which is a, a scripture that many people keep in their minds. It's a memory scripture. For we know that all things work together. All things. Nothing left out. The big, the bad, the ugly, the good, the happy. All things work together for good to them who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I hope this was helpful. Have a wonderful Sabbath.